Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you all again today. Thank you for inviting us into your homes today. It's great to be with you. And I pray that you will know the blessing of the Lord as we worship together, as we pray together, and as we receive God's word together. You know, there's so much going on in this world at the moment with everything that's going on with vaccinations and lockdowns and so on and so on and things happening with the economy and things happening around the world. But there is one constant in which we rejoice and that is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. He is still the Lord who saves all who will call upon his name. He is still the Lord who heals. He is still the Lord who sets the captives free, who makes the blind to see, the deaf to hear, and the lame to leap for joy. That is our Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we are going to worship him together. In just a moment, we're going to be praying uh, for uh, the persecuted church in Iraq. And uh, I know that um, there's some more information in that prayer section, so I'm not going to give you the information now. So listen in, but pray with us for our brothers and sisters who are persecuted for following Jesus Christ, those who live in Iraq. But we're going to begin, as we always do, by declaring the greatness of our God, the majesty of our God. He is Lord. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. So join with us this morning as we sing God of Wonders Beyond Our Galaxy. God bless you. To earth and sky The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are holy, holy The universe declares your majesty you are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth. Early in the morning, I will celebrate the light. As I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are. 
Hello. We're going to pray now, particularly for the church in Iraq. There's a small minority of the population of Christians there. But they are faithful, faithful to their Lord. But in recent times, they have come in under increasing persecution. Some are being killed, some are being physically attacked, churches are being attacked. If they try to evangelise, blasphemy laws are used against them. And of course, with COVID, like many congregations throughout the world, they haven't actually been able to physically go to church for some time. So we're going to pray for them now. Oh, Daddy, we just thank you that you love each and every one of your children. You love the Christians in Iraq. You love to bless them. You love their faithfulness. And we just thank you for that, Lord, that they are faithful to you when it's difficult from day to day to be a Christian in a country such as Iraq. We thank you that that country is on your heart. You haven't turned your back on them. And we speak over that country and we declare that one day that country will be holy for you. The Lord God Almighty, that country will one day be your country. The majority of people will be for you. The name of Jesus will be spoken clearly throughout that country without any fear of um, prosecution or danger. We just thank you, Lord, that you are so great that you can carry this out in Jesus' name. And Lord, I just thank you that you have given us particularly the Psalm, Psalm 91, a psalm of protection. And I want to read that now for my brothers and sisters in Iraq. That you will protect them and take care of them. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble and will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Lord, we just thank you for those promises. We thank you those promises are for the people, the church of Iraq. But we thank you that the rest of the church can also call on those promises. Those promises to protect us, to take care of us. That we have angels we can call on who will come and do our bidding 
and rescue us because you are the great redeemer you are the one who has rescued us all so i thank you i thank you for what is happening in iraq in the church i thank you for those people that are there for you and they declare your goodness and i just thank you lord that you love them so much as you do us your love is greatest to those who are suffering praise you lord praise you praise your name praise you lord and thank you lord thank you for that church in iraq in jesus name amen i'm reading today from the book of matthew chapter 16 starting at verse 24 <clears throat> then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give to exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his work. When you read passages of scripture like this, it's very easy sometimes to think that the Christian life is, is just horrible. Uh, that, you know, you think of the cross, you think of this, this torturous death that Jesus died on our behalf. We think of the nails driven through his wrists and through his feet. We think of the crown of thorns on his head. We think of the scourging that went before it. And we think Jesus is saying, take up your cross and follow me. And, and it's very easy to think, well, the Christian life must just be absolutely awful. And I know many people in the past who've said to me that before they became a Christian, they thought that, that they didn't want to follow Jesus because if they did, he would just find the thing that they least wanted to do and, uh, and he would make them do that. He would just make their life absolutely miserable. But that is not what Jesus is saying here when he says, if you're going to follow him, you must take up your cross. What Jesus is saying here is you must deny yourself. That means that you no longer run your life on your terms. Now you run your life on his terms. You run your life according to the way that he says you should. In other words, he comes first and that's that. What he says goes. But the thing is, Jesus hasn't come to make our lives miserable. Jesus came that we may have life and life in all its fullness. Jesus came that we may have everlasting life. Jesus came that we may have joy, that we may have peace with God, that we might be reconciled with God. There's nothing bad about what Jesus gives us. So when he says, take up your cross, what is he saying? He's saying, if you want to experience the love of God, if you want to experience reconciliation with God, if you want to know that your sins are forgiven, if you want to know all those things, if you want to enter into everlasting life, then you don't come to it on your terms. You come to it on my terms, on God's terms. I can speak from personal experience. You know, many, many years ago before I became a Christian, I used to wonder if God was really interested in me. And I kind of knew deep down that he probably was. But, you know, I wanted to do things my own way. I wanted to live the life that a, a normal uh, teenage, young, 20-year-old male would do. And I wanted to sow my oats and I wanted to do all the things that most young men of that age would want to do. And uh, people would uh, speak to me about God and, and they would say, you know, you really need to follow Christ. And, and I would know deep down that actually what they were saying was right. But I still wanted to live life my way. I still wanted to do my own thing. And so I kind of made an ultimatum to God. I set God a, a, a demand and I set God a challenge. I said, OK, God, 
if you are interested in me, if it's true that, that you died for me, and if it's true that everything these people are saying to me is true, then I'm setting you a challenge and I want you to do something for me. I want you to prove to me that you are real. And this is how I want you to do it. I even set the terms of how I wanted God to answer what I was saying. I said, if you're really interested in me, if what these people are saying is true, then I want heaven to open. I want angels to appear. I want a firework display. I want the hallelujah chorus in the background. I want a big sign. I want you to prove it to me. I want you to show me beyond a shadow of doubt that this is the truth. And every time I would make this demand of God, guess what? Nothing happened. And then one day, one of my colleagues brought me a Bible. Somebody had written me a letter and in that letter they had put a tea bag. And on that tea bag they'd written a verse of scripture for me to look up and I didn't know what this verse of scripture said. And uh, I happened to mention it to a, a work colleague who, uh, who was a Christian. And, uh, and he said, well, I don't know what it says. And, and I thought that was that. I thought that would be the end of it. Next day he appeared and he handed me a Bible and he said, there you go. You can look up uh, what this verse of scripture says. And, uh, and it freaked me out because uh, he he didn't want any money for it. It was a gift. It was, and that was, why would somebody give me a Bible as a gift? It, it was, it was, whoa. But I went home that evening and as I was walking home, I said, okay, God, this is it. This is crunch time. I said, when I find this verse of scripture, then I want heaven to open, angels to appear. I want lights to shine. I want the music playing. I want the hallelujah chorus. You name it. I want it. This is the time. Okay. If this isn't the time, then uh, I don't want to know. I'm just going to carry on doing things my own way. And eventually I found this verse of scripture and it was in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. And it said, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And guess what? Nothing happened. And I thought, well, that's that. What a load of nonsense this all is. I can, I can dismiss all this God stuff. I can get rid of all this God stuff. I can just carry on living life my own way. But then I did something. I just put my finger down at random, flicked through this, this Bible, put my finger down at random and looked to see what it said as I put my finger down at random. And it said, I tell you the truth, a wicked and adulterous generation will always seek a miraculous sign. Well, I, I thought that's, that's, that's just a coincidence. That's just a coincidence. So I carried on flicking, carried on flicking, see what other nonsense was in this Bible. And I put my finger down and it said, I tell you, no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of a whale for three days, so the son of man. I thought, no, it could still be a coincidence. Carried on flicking, carried on flicking, put my finger down. The sign you are looking for, you will not receive. Carried on flicking you will not get the sign you were looking for. Every time I put my finger down, must have been about 10, a dozen times, but every single time, all in different books in the Bible or in different bits written by different people, I put my finger down and it would say, you're not going to get the sign you're looking for. You will not get the sign you were demanding. And eventually I realized that yes, God was interested in me. God was interested in me enough to answer my challenge, not in the way that I expected him to, that I was demanding him to, but in the way that showed me that I was not to come to him on my terms. I was to come to him on his terms. I had to accept Jesus hook, line and sinker. That was it. There had to be nothing else. It wasn't about Jesus, please be the, the, the cream topping on the pudding of my life. It had to be that Jesus was everything. And I tell you, I made the decision to follow Jesus and I have never, ever regretted that decision. Yes, there have been times when it's been tough. There have been times when it's been very difficult. There have been times when I've struggled with depression and I've wanted to, to see my life come to an end. But God has been faithful in that time. And I've come through all of that and I'm free from that. And God has been faithful and God has been so loving. But it's been as I have remembered that I come to him on his terms, not on mine. There is only way, only one way 
to receive the salvation that God gives. And that is not by our terms. It's on his terms. His terms say this. You accept Jesus Christ. You lay down your life for my sake. That means you are no longer the one in charge of your life. You do as I say. Because if you do as I say, then you will receive eternal life. And he says, my commandments are not burdensome. He says, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You see, when you come unto him on his terms, there's no struggle in it. When you come to him on his terms, there is peace. When you come to him on his terms, there is joy. When you come to him on his terms, there is life. There is life everlasting and you can enter into it right now. You know, I remember many years ago speaking in a Category A prison. I'm not going to say which one it was. I'm not going to give away any details. But there was a man there listening as I preached the gospel and he spoke to one of the team afterwards and he said as that man was preaching the gospel he said I heard Jesus speak to me in an audible voice and in that audible voice Jesus said to him I will save you but when you come to trial you have to tell the truth you see this man was up for trial he had committed murder he knew he was guilty the the Everybody knew he was guilty, but his lawyers had said to him, we can get you off. We can get you off. We have discovered there are technicalities we can get you off on. All you have to do is plead not guilty and we can use the way the law is worded and so on. We can do that. We can use those technicalities. We can use those loopholes to get you off 100% guaranteed. But the Lord spoke to him. In that prison as he was awaiting his trial he said I will save you but you must tell the truth in other words if you want me to save you you come on my terms well that man changed his plea when he came to trial and he pleaded guilty and the judge said to him why why did you do that why did you change your plea and he said it's very simple God found me in prison you see that man now is one of the freest people you can meet. He's still in prison, but he is full of joy. He is full of peace. He is full of life. He is leading other prisoners to Christ because he came to Jesus on his terms, not on his own, but on the terms that Jesus gave. If you would follow Jesus, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. But Jesus gives this promise. He says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. That's if you come on your own terms. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Come to God on his terms. The terms are very, very simple. Let go of your old life. Let go of sin. Repent of sin. Turn away from sin. Believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible promises that if you will do that, you will be saved. But you come to him on his terms, not on yours. Not on yours. Whoever confesses Jesus before men, Jesus will confess before his Father in heaven. You come to him on his terms. Will you come to Jesus today? Will you receive the gift of everlasting life today? To do that, you have to turn away from your sin and decide to follow Jesus all the days of your life. If you will do that, if you will ask Jesus to save you, then he will, if you mean it. And he will fill you with the same Holy Spirit that was present at the creation of the world, the same Holy Spirit who is one with God the Father and one with Jesus the Son. He will fill you with himself so that you can live life free from that sin that has been the ruling factor in your life before now. You can receive the everlasting life that only he can give. So will you come to him today? That is the challenge. Whose terms are you coming on? Jesus did not come so you could just do your own thing and expect him to, 
to be the, the, the insurance guarantee on the top of it. Jesus says, you come, you give me everything. And in return, I give you everlasting life. Will you come to him on his terms today? If you will, then simply pray with me. If you will come to God on his terms. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the Son of God. I thank you that you laid down your life for me. I thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Lord, I thank you that you gave everything for me. And so, Lord, I come to you today and I say I do not come on my own terms. I turn away from sin. I turn away from being the Lord of my own life. And I surrender to you, Jesus. I ask you to be my Lord, to be my God, to be my Saviour. And I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me fit for heaven to receive that gift of everlasting life through what you have done for me at the cross. I surrender my life to you today, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. If you've prayed that prayer and you've really meant it, then Jesus will have heard that prayer and he will have saved you, even you. You will know your sins forgiven. You will know that you are cleansed from everything that is unrighteous, everything that is unholy. You are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. If you have prayed that prayer, then please just get in touch. Let me know what you have done. Say, I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ and somebody will get in touch. We will pray with you. We will help you in any way we can, wherever you are in the world, to pray with you, to help you, to instruct you and to teach you what it is like following Jesus who has given everything for you. So please get in touch. We're back again next week at the same time, 10 o'clock. Until then, God bless you and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Hello. We really hope you've enjoyed being with us this morning. We certainly enjoyed having you tune in with us. If you'd like to know anything more about Jesus, who he is, and the wonderful life that he offers each and every one of us, then please get in touch. You can email pastor at churchofthetruevine.org or alternatively you can visit us on our website, which is churchofthetruevine.org. If you'd like anybody to pray with you, to pray about something that's happening in your life, or just be there for you, then please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, we just pray every blessing from the Lord upon you. Thank you.